Well, a very good morning to everybody, and I'll tell you what, it's, it's really tough not to hear a song like that, not just get char charged up and sing along with it, so that's what I was doing. So, uh, Fortunately for you, I had my mic shut off, so you know nobody should be you know, getting ill at this point in time for my singing. But, uh, welcome and good morning. Happy Valentine's Day today, and uh, celebration of a day of love is the way I like to look at it. And uh, so it's a wonderful Sunday morning out here. Kind of a brisk start to the day today. And I think that is a uh, gross understatement to say the least. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's funny when you go out there and you see jackets on the icicles. So you know it's a cold day outside. So, well, you know, we're excited because we are a church on the move. We got a lot of fun things going on. Last Wednesday night, we had a planning session, a meeting in the, the uh, new space down there, and we we're talking about upcoming events and programs and outreach and all kinds of good things that we have planned for and coming up this year that we already have in play. And uh, February 17th, this next Wednesday, is Ash Wednesday already. This year simply is flying by. And we will be having our service here at 7 o'clock. So we will have an Ash Wednesday service here. And Orange Track Racing starts its 15th season. Can you believe that? Oh, wait a minute. 16th season. You may want to reprint these. <laughs> uh, we've got some flyers back here. Never mind that the top it says 15th. It's actually 16th season this year. And... Uh, so February 20th, we will be having both in-person and virtual racing. And uh, I invite you to go to our website, orangetrackracing.org, uh, for the latest rule changes that we have for this year and details on our upcoming racing season. February 24th, we start a brand new study, which will be Wednesday after next, and it'll be the Overcomer by Dr. David Jeremiah. And uh, that's going to take us all the way up until Easter. Uh, some excellent messages in here, kind of a preparatory message in here on how to overcome the world as it faces us today, and basically how to prepare ourselves to be that Christian that we need to be. March 3rd, we're going to have our first Bible study in the new space down there. And again, that will be Overcomer at 7 o'clock, 310 3rd Street Southeast. Uh, we're going to have things. Our website will be updated with our new address. All of our materials updated with the new address and everything. Really, really excited about having that happen. So what are we going to do? We're going to charge right in on March 6th, and we're going to have a movie night. That's right. I'm looking forward to it. It's a great movie. Um, and it kind of talks about today's life as, as it faces a lot of people. And the name of the movie is War Room. And we will be having that March 6, 6 p.m. And again, 310 3rd Street Southeast in our new space. Uh, doors are going to open at 5.30. There is no charge for that. And of course, we will have hot dogs, brownie bites for all you that look towards and also probably those lemon bites as well, if they make it. Now, the problem is the last time they didn't quite make it there. And I have to tell you, they were really good. So uh, March 6th, we're gonna have that new movie in there. And uh, you know, it's kind of neat. Looks can be deceiving and the answers often come from unexpected sources. But you're going to have to see the movie to understand what I mean by that. So we'll see you on March 6th. And then March 7th, we start our first worship service in the new space and at a new time. So we are moving this ser service up an hour. So it'll be at 10 o'clock. Um, and welcome to come ahead of time for some, some uh, kind of exploring if you'd like to do that. A little bit of fellowship time before the service starts. And our coffee time, and then service at 10 o'clock. So a lot of neat things coming up. 
We're gonna be doing uh, some fix up and clean up inside the area. Painting starts on the 19th. They're hopefully done by the 23rd. And uh, we're going to be trying to do our move in and everything and get things ready to go so that March 1st we'll be in the new space and ready to operate. So a lot of neat things already happening this year and we look forward to planning some other things out as well. Uh, we've got a lot of new things in, in store that we're working on right now, some uh, grief counseling and things like that that we feel is really, really necessary and very timely for things that uh, we are going through as a congregation right now. So on to worship this morning. Let's open with a word of prayer, shall we? Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now. We open our hearts to you. We open our ears to hear your word today. And we ask that you would help us to receive that word into our hearts. Believe and receive so that we can understand the fullness of your word and understand the grace and the mercy that you have and the blessings that you have for us each and every day. Lord, for those things that we have left undone and those things that we've done, Lord, we just ask for that grace and mercy today. And we ask for your healing touch to be upon us today. Whether we are suffering from an illness or grieving a loss of a loved one or a close one or even just simply a friend. Lord, we lift it all up to you today and we claim these things as victories in your name, in the name of Jesus today. And as we go into the worship time today, we ask a special blessing on Pastor Terry as he brings your message and your word forth unto us, Lord, help it to just sink to our very core and to touch us and help us to hear that message that you helped him prepare for us today. Thank you, Lord, for all these things in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. So today's call to worship that Pastor Terry has picked out comes from Romans 8, uh, 18 and 19, and this is from the New Living Translation. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal in us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. And I was listening to some of my old music the other day and I, I came across a song by the group Petra. And uh, it was a group that talks about going before the beam of seat, that we'll all have to go before that beam of seat. And we'll all have to be judged for what we do but that Jesus is already there and he's standing there for us and he is interceding on our behalf. So those things that we did are all white plain through the blood of Jesus. And all we have to do is take him into our hearts and believe and receive him unto us. And it says, for I consider that all the sufferings of this present time and this present life are not worth being compared to the glory that is about to be revealed to us and in us and for us. And what I really want you to understand today is conferred on us. No matter what we have done, no matter what we've gone through, no matter what we are presently going through, and no matter what we will go through in the future, the sum total of all of that put together is not compared to anything, to the glory that is awaiting for us when we come into his presence. We can compare a thimble of water to the sea, but we cannot compare our sufferings with coming glory. Belief in what the scriptures say will change our lives. Yet some of us need to have our eyes lifted from the dirt towards heaven. There's simply no comparison of our pleasure or pain with the glory that is yet to be revealed to us through Christ. We need to stop and look up and understand God's grace for what it is, total forgiveness through Jesus. I had that reminded me yesterday of what total forgiveness needs to be for each and every one of us. No matter what we've gone through, no matter what we've experienced, 
that total forgiveness that Christ has for us for what we've done, we have to pass that grace on to everyone else, no matter who's wronged us, no matter what we've done. I was convicted in my heart about that yesterday. So it hits home. See, it, it no, matter, <clears throat> no longer matters what this life brings to us, that Jesus will bring us through it. Jesus will bring us through it. Who we are, what we were before, what we gave our lives to Jesus is for no consequence. Yes, there's going to be a final judgment, but Jesus is there to bring us through that as well. But first, we need to have that relationship, not just lip service. We need to have more than just knowing about God, knowing about Jesus. We have to have that relationship with God, that relationship with Jesus. That's what will bring us into his glory on that day. Amen. Good morning. I spent this week um, doing a lot of studying and preparing, and I had a, I had this whole message. I told Mark was and I were talking about messages and getting ready and um, the next series that we were going to start, and I had this whole message that I had planned out and I had kind of the outline was in my head, and then I went to worship last Sunday, and Mark taught on um, preparing for the coming season. And when he did that, it's like some of the things that he said and, and the one thing that stuck in me was making time for God. Are we making time for God? Because we're getting into a season of planning. We're getting into a season where we're preparing. Um, we just came out of a a season of preparing where we were preparing for the celebration of Jesus' birth. And now we're about to enter in. It seems like they're almost too close, but it seems so right that they are. But we're in that season now where we're about to start preparing for what Jesus does for us on the cross. And it's so important because God's going to send his son back. And when he does that, if we're not ready, if we have not made time for him, if we've not accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, Time will be up. There will be no making time for God at that point. And, and that's why this stuck with me so hard this week. And so um, I just spent a lot of time this week taking time to reflect. And I was reflecting on my life and where I had been and the things that I had done and the, the grace that God had given to me and the grace that he extends to you, that free grace. Now, then... Then it was, you know, God, I'm on my walk with you. I, I understand this walk that I have with you. But are there changes that you want me to make right now and in the future? What do you want me to do? And then I was immediately drawn right back to Mark's message last week. And, and out of Matthew two, uh, 3, verse 2, it says, John's message was this. It was, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, Scripture tells us we don't know the day nor the time when he will return. And it just drives me crazy when I see uh, pastors and, and, and people of faith going, well, the Bible says this, and we're seeing this, so it must be getting close. I hate to tell you, but this, these things that are happening have been going on for 2,000 years. Just a little bit different uh, in how they're playing out, but they're the exact same things that are happening. But the question I have for you this morning then is, not are you a Christian? Because that, that's almost like uh, people throwing out and saying, I love you. It gets tossed out pretty easy, doesn't it? Now, this is... Not are you a Christian, are you a follower 
of Jesus Christ? Have you accepted his teachings and have you accepted the grace, mercy, love, and forgiveness that God extends to us and come into a relationship? And over the past month, you know, we had, we had our series, the Do You Believe movie series that we did. And, and I can't help but thinking back to that movie and, and that scene where Pastor Mark sees that young pregnant girl in the alley foraging for whatever she can find and he picks her up and he brings her home and he leaves her in the car and he goes into the house and he starts talking to his wife. That's, that's living out our faith and we've talked about that. But then there's this one. It's where the whole movie starts. You know, they got this street preacher and he's got his big old cross. And he's got, you know, he's got the little wheels on him. He's got his big old cross and he's walking around and he's preaching. He's, he's not taking it easy. He's going out and he's asking. He walks right up to Pastor Matthew in his car. And he looks at him and says, and I can't do it in his voice. He has, there's, it's just, if you've seen the movie, you can hear his voice in your head. But he looks right at Pastor Matthew and he says, do you believe in the cross of Christ? And I love Pastor Matthew. Uh, response, because, you know, this is our typical response. Well, I am a pastor. <laughs> okay. Thought process in my mind is, yeah, you're a pastor, but do you really believe? So that, that leads into the, the street pastor's next question. He says, if you believe, then the question is, what are you going to do about it? And, and I think that some all too often just, they think they're doing the right things. You know, they, they, they say things like, well, I go to church, or I, I go to Bible study. But being a follower of Jesus is way more than that. It's more than just church. It's more than just a Bible study. It's more than coming to a movie or, or to the orange track or whatever it is. And I have to wonder how many people think that that's enough. How many of us just go through the motions and think that we are good to go? If I just do this, then I'll get here. You know, the world has taught us that. If, if I go to school and I get good grades, then I'm going to get a degree and I'll get a good job. Does that always happen? No. If I just read my Bible and I go to church on Sunday, and I sit in a pew, and I, I listen, and I show up to Bible study on whatever day it is, at whatever time, and I listen. Maybe I'll ask a question or answer a question. Is that enough? Well, that's where we get to this. Is your Christian walk on a narrow path? Or is it on the wide path? In other words, what guides you on your Christian walk? Do you see the Bible, this book, do you see this as the inspired word of God? Do you see the Bible as a revealed will of God, as the all-sufficient rule of faith and standard for daily living? And if you've read our, our statement of faith, then you know that's right out of the, the very beginning of that. Are you using this as your guide to your daily living? So let's get to some scripture that really calls out this narrow and, and wide path. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. And this is what Jesus tells us. He says, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. Now, if you are an old soul, or if you grew up where most of us did, in the, in the era that most of us did, when you hear Highway to Hell, you are automatically think of a song. Here's the problem. 
when I think of that highway to hell, I think of all the, all the stuff that we're being indoctrinated on in the news and on websites and on the TV and at the movie theater. Everywhere you turn, everything is like a, a wide road that leads straight to hell. And, and you know what? Here's the thing. Pastors are really scared. I know Mark isn't, and I know I'm not, but they're scared to, to warn people of going to hell. And I see a little bit of shaking of heads. Did we lose our feed? Uh-oh. Well, we don't want people to miss out on this. And of course, it's my phone, so we'll take a look. I think this right. is on you personally, though. Yeah. It's still streaming. We're still live. According to that, I just start, restarted, oh, you just restarted it, it. But I think it's on your personal Facebook, not on Gray Street. Oh, well, let's fix that up. Oh. Well, sure, that part. And, well. time for God this morning, and, and uh, we don't want anybody to miss out, so we want to make sure we got that live stream back up and going. But here's the thing, and, and as I was talking about, this highway to hell and, and all the things that are going on, here's the thing, when we talk about the TV and the news and the, and the paper and the magazines and everything, that's, there's so much noise. There's so much noise. Diane and I have been watching this show, it's um, uh, Tiny House Nation. You know, and it's about these families that are moving in from these like 3,000 square foot, and, and back in the 80s we called them McMansions. They're these huge homes and they're going into these three, four, or even 500 square foot homes. And they're paring down this stuff. And you know their number one motivation? Their number one motivation is to have more personal time. And a lot of these builds, you don't see any TVs in them. There's no noise, there's no distraction. It allows them to spend time together. And because, here's the thing, it, they realize that it messes with their relationships with each other. But I'm thinking, it's also messing with our relationship with the one that truly matters, with God. So there's a lot of noise. And that narrow path is about a decision that we make to follow Jesus and make him our Lord and Savior. John records Jesus talking about this in chapter 10, 7 and 9. He says, so he explained it to them. And this is Jesus' words. He says, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me were thieves and robbers. But the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved, and they will come and go freely and will find good pastures. Now this answers the question, is there more than one way to heaven? The answer is no. There's just one. That's through Jesus. We hear that noise in the world that says all roads go to heaven. All, all religions lead to the same place because it's just a different way of looking at it. Now, now, Jesus is very specific about this. There is only one way, and that is through him. And Jesus is that gate. He is the door through which we have to go to get to heaven. And so when we trust in Jesus, then we are guaranteed our salvation. Our eternal lives begin when we trust in Christ, and we are kept safe by him. Just as the shepherd keeps the sheep safe. And, and those who don't believe this, they're the ones that are hearing all that noise and are being deceived by the world. They're the ones that are being led astray by the false teachers and those teachings. And the part that's scary about that is there's churches out there. Christian, 
Christian, I'm going to put quotes around it. Christian churches out there that have false teaching and false pr prophets and false teachers in them, and they're leading people astray. Hence that broad highway. So let's face it. Compared to other places in the world, here in the States, we've got it pretty good, don't we? We do. Um, we can come together like this, in person, online, and we can worship and hear a good biblical message. Yeah, we have our challenges and our difficulties. We have our health issues and we have money issues and there's all kinds of things going on. And this past year has just exasperated that more than we ever thought it would. But there are people in this world that are less fortunate than we are. Now, if we think about the people here in the United States, there are programs out there to help people. Um, you know, uh, Eight Days of Hope, last, uh, the last two Saturdays, gave away groceries to whoever wanted them. No questions asked. Just gave them. We've got, there's that couple that, that has created a nonprofit that uh, back in the derecho, when the derecho, after the derecho hit, they have a, now have a food truck or a food trailer that was gifted to them uh, because they got on national news. And they are under the bridge over on 8th, uh, 8th Street Southwest. And they are giving out meals almost every day. There's places people can go to get help. In other places of the world, there is no such help. And then it becomes survival of the fittest. Here, if you are sick, you can get health care. And, and if you don't have any money, you can get that taken care of. There are two free clinics here in town. We can get the things that we need. In other countries, you just get brushed aside, and when you pass, you pass. They don't have that same thing, and they don't have the same privilege that we do here in the United States to be able to hear a message or to preach a message or to speak about our faith. They can't do that. So when we have it hard, there's others that have it harder. In John 16, 31 and 33, uh, even Jesus asks if we believe. And, and here's the thing. Here in the States, faith is starting to wane. Where we have all these things that, that we have access to. Faith is, is, is waning and, and fewer people are going to church on Sunday. Whether it's in person or whether they're watching online. Fewer people are doing that. But in other countries where they have absolutely nothing. Christianity is exploding. That doesn't make sense because here we you know, people like to blame God for their circumstances. There they reach out to God in their circumstances. So Jesus asks this. He says, do you finally believe? But the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when you will be scattered, each one going his own way, leaving me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you may have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Now there's a hope message in there. And we've just heard Jesus tell us that the world is out of sync with God. And over the past year, we have become more and more disconnected. People who are in counseling roles and social workers and that are busier now than ever because people are disconnected. And, and I've seen reports where suicide in teens in high schools that have been homeschooling since this pandemic started are more likely to take their own lives than they were the year before because they're disconnected from their friends, their personal relationships, and they aren't coping well with that. But there's all kinds of issues out there. This is, that's just one. I mean, I get calls at work all the time from customers who are upset because first real problem, they didn't get their emails.
But when I think about that, it goes right back to what I said. The world is out of sync with God. These people, when we finally figure out what's going on, it's usually that the sync option in their email settings got undone. So they're out of sync. Their emails are out of sync. They're not getting the information they got. And if we're out of sync with God, then we're not getting the information that we need from him. And they're not getting the messages that they need to hear. And, and when we don't get those messages that we need from the Bible, then we become so out of sync with God that what happens? Our Christian walk goes sideways. We get off that narrow path. So I have to ask, what are you doing on a daily basis to stay connected? Here's some thoughts. If you feel weak, depend on God's strength. He will strengthen you. And, and if you cannot see a way out of the sin that's in your life, because Satan's really good about pointing that out and making sure that you feel awful about it, accept God's mercy. And do you feel lost? Do you feel uh, just away from God? Seek direction from his word and know that God is patiently waiting for you. There's a reason his son hasn't come back. There's a reason Jesus hasn't come back and taken us all with him. Because God knows who those are that are still going to accept him. Because he's so all-knowing. And... Um, just like GPS can give us directions from where we are at a particular moment and tell us where to go, the Bible does that for our walk. Now, I found, I'm going to have Diane change this. She, she posted this on Facebook, and I, I couldn't help but giggle when I saw it. It just says, Moses lost in the desert, year 40. And, and the people are just saying, you know, it's, the bubbles say, um, recalculating. Anybody ever heard their GPS in their car say that? Recalculating. Well, if we get lost, do you hear that? If you're not in God's word, you're not hearing that message that you need to get back on the right path. And so if you were lost and, um, and you've never looked to God, maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe you are tuning in to us for the very first time and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. God is patiently waiting for you to turn your life over to him. And here's, the, here's the, the best part of this. You don't have to have it all together first. Or maybe you were following God and you got lost. Just simply repent. Ask for forgiveness and turn back to him. God is always reaching out to us with that grace, that mercy, that love, and that forgiveness. And, and he gives us new life in Christ. Now think about this. We've all heard the story, uh, uh, those who have been coming, of Lazarus and when he died. And Jesus intentionally not going to see him. And by the time he got there, he had been dead for four days. Very poignant reason for doing that. He needed Lazarus to be dead, for the people to know that he was dead, for his glory to be shown, to, to do this very thing, to how if we turn our lives over to him, it becomes a new life. So when Jesus has them open up the tomb and he says, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus is coming from a point of death into new life. And that new life is through Christ. So it's a teaching that we get from that. And in Colossians 3, 1 and 3, uh, Paul says this. He says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. So let's talk about this a little bit. What does that mean, new life in Christ? Well, we have an answer to the question that Pastor Mark asked a lot. And it's just four simple words that, he's, that he says. He says, life ends, eternity where? Well, if we become new in Christ, eternity is in heaven. We go through that narrow gate, down that narrow path. And if we have entered into a relationship with Jesus, 
It's not a one-way street. Jesus is always reaching out to us. He's always extending. But it's a two-way street. We have to do the same. We have to reach back out to him. You know from personal experience, and if you say you don't, think about this a little bit. In a relationship, whether it's with your, your wife or your husband, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your friends, your family, if it is only one-sided, if there's only one participant in that relationship, what happens to that relationship? It falls apart. So in this relationship, in this, on this two-way street, we're changed and led by the Holy Spirit. And because of that, we look at our sin and we don't want to do it anymore. We, we become new and we don't want anything to do with it. Our attitude changes. We become different people. And I, I know I've mentioned this before, but I came back from a, a Promise Keepers event where I turned my life over to God. I said, God, you get it 100% now. And, and the look on Diane's face when I came home. Now, I, I'm certainly a long ways away down my walk from where I was at at that point. But there was a, a change, a visible change that she could see in the way that I was acting, in the way that I spoke, in the way that I behaved towards her. Our attitude changes. And, and we now look at life through God's perspective. And, and we set our sights as the scriptures it cites on the realities of heaven. We seek what God desires. We see what God sees. We live out our faith because loving Christ means loving and serving others. Too often, I, I, and, and, and I saw this as, as a youth pastor, there'd be a group of, of Christian kids and they would have some kind of a, maybe a Bible study going or a gathering going, and someone new shows up. And, and maybe they aren't dressed the way that the group thinks they should be dressed. Or they, they've got, you know, piercings or, or whatever the case may be. And they look at this person, and what do they do? They immediately judge that person. They don't accept them for whom they are. And in doing that, are they being Christ-like? Has their attitude changed is the Holy Spirit leading their lives? And I have to say, no. That's not the way that it should go. James 2, 14, 19 says this, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye, and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, but faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds, but I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Now, faith without action is like knowing how to do something, but never doing it. It's just useless information taking up space in your brain. Mark, called, Mark said knowledge. It's, it's about you have knowledge, but what are you doing with that knowledge? Are you doing anything? And no, you're not. It's, it's like... You know, you have laundry to do, and it's piling up, but you never do it. It just sits there dirty. Mark recently taught that, that um, just having knowledge means that you just know something. Well, it's all great and well to know something. I know some things about algebra. Don't do it well. well. I know how to do a lot of things. But do I do them? Are they, are they, am I making use of them? If we don't use something, what happens? If you don't use it, the saying says you lose it. In high school and, and in first year two of, of college, I took French. 
I even got the opportunity to go over there. And every once in a while, I'll have a French dream, a French speaking dream. But when I ha when that happens, I'm not really sure the next day what I said. I can remember, and, and Bruce was there, and I know Mark was there, and Lori was there, and Diane was there, and we were at Mission of Hope, and it was for a service. And there were a couple guys sitting in front of me, and, and Bruce said, or uh, Bruce said something in Spanish, and I immediately quipped, I, "I don't, I speak French, not Spanish." And two guys sitting in front of me both turned around and started speaking to me in French. I had no idea what they were saying. None was. I hadn't been using it for 30 years. I had no idea. But that's what happens. If we don't use our faith, it becomes stale, and we forget how to use it, and we don't use it. See, um, people, if we... Here's the problem. I know people who are not Christians who live better lives than Christians. They live with the same things, they do the same things that Jesus teaches, yet they don't have a relationship with Christ. They think it's all a big fairy tale. The problem is, is that they're not going to go to heaven. They're going to, they're going to go to hell. And, and, and I hate that for them. And, and that's why Mark and I are so passionate about making sure that the word is taught biblically and properly. Uh, it's just another reason why that highway to hell is so broad. Now, this passage that we just uh, went through, it, says, it talks about seeing someone in need and wishing them well when it's within your power to do something. Jesus saw a fig tree and saw that it wasn't producing any fruit, and what happened? He cursed it and, and it withered. The next day when they came back through that area, the disciples realized that that tree had withered. If we are not exercising our faith, that there's no fruit from our faith, then we wither. And God knows our hearts. But here's the thing. You may have that relationship with Jesus. You may have, you're doing some things, but you're just, it's not visible, it's not being shown. God, yes, he knows your heart. But here's the problem. We're human. So seeing is believing. If we don't see it, we don't believe it. So people see our hearts by what we say and what we do. And if we're not making time for God in our lives, they're not going to see that. Why would anyone want to be a Christian with the way that some professing Christians act. And y'all know what I'm talking about. Too often I hear people, or, or I read about people commenting on Christians, and they say, look what so-and-so said or did, and they call themselves a Christian? Or my mom, uh, in her latter years, she got tired of going to church because of all the hypocrites at church. Well, again, our actions show our faith by how we love and serve others. But here's the thing, don't get me wrong. All manner of people are invited into God's house because you have to start somewhere. Remember what I said before, you don't have, it, don't have to have it all together? Well, None of us have it all together. We would have it all together if there wasn't that original sin, but there was, and therefore we live in a simple world. We're born into it. And then there's the, the services that I've been to where the worship service is dictated by the people and not by the Holy Spirit. I have watched as someone sat while the preacher was, preacher was preaching and, and, and they were doing this, or they, maybe they were in leadership position with the church and they looked at the pastor and got, finally got the pastor's attention and it was like, 
you're going too long. And then what happens? Well, and then you got to cut a song or maybe cut some verses out of some songs because you don't want to go too long. And here's, here's the sad part. The pastor and, and even the worship leader will get up there and they will apologize for the service going too long. Or there's members that complain afterwards or in the following week, oh, that service was too long. You have some place to be? I mean, God gives us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Can you not carve out some time for him? Think about it this way. What would 10% of a day be for God? So there's 24 hours in a day. So 10% of that is going to be what? Somewhere between two and three hours a day. Are you spending two to three hours a day with God? Just giving in that? Are you spending that time in prayer? Are you spending that time in the word? And, and we could go on and on. But then there's services that I've been to where the Holy Spirit is in control and the pastor's on fire with the message. And it's, it doesn't matter doesn't matter. I, I, there's an a African-American church, a Burundi congregation, that when they came into the church that I was a youth pastor at, at one time, they came in and, and they had their service. I had no idea what to expect. It was two and a half hours long. And they were speaking in their native tongue. I had really didn't know exactly what they were saying, but the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and I could get the gist of what was going on there. And the messages... Uh, sometimes they'll get tossed aside. Well, God gave me a message this morning, but the one that I had written isn't what you're going to hear today. Or maybe the songs are played longer. Maybe the, the worship leader is feeling that Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden they go back into the, uh, the first verse, or they, they play the chorus over and over again, and people are just standing there. And, well, one of the comedians, John Chris, he calls this goalposts or carrying the baby, but they're, they're worshiping, right? And, and, and they're into it, and we're, and, oh, and all of a sudden, someone breaks out and says, amen! And, and the Holy Spirit's just working through it. Is your life like that? When you make time for God, you are like that all the time. Uh, just this past week, think about this, think about being excited for something, think about being committed to something. Two firefighters, we're fighting a fire this past week, and something happened to the hose, and they both got injured and sent to the hospital. But here's the thing. They did it. They went out there willingly. The wind chill at that point was like 20, 25 below. They were out there battling a fire for people they didn't even know. Yet, they were all in. Are you all in with God? Are you making time for him and, and being all in for him? Or maybe it's the soldier who leaves his family and friends for months and even years to defend our freedoms. They're all in. Are you all in for God? And throughout history, we read about people giving of themselves for others. You know, Fox's uh, Book of the Martyrs or, or DC Talk has like three or four books about, out about martyrs right now. And are you doing that? And there's so many others that we'll never ever hear about. And then, then there's this guy that I was reading about. And everybody loved to hate this guy. I mean, he hung out with people that others looked down on. He even got accused of things that he didn't even do. And, and when he got accused of those, he got arrested. And they beat him. And they threw him in jail for, for a short time while they were beating him. And then, then they took him out and beat him some more. And the judge... Well, he gave him the death penalty. That was Jesus. He didn't do anything to deserve what he got. But he put his life on the line for us. He died on the cross for us. Are you ready? Like it said at the very beginning, when we were talking about that uh, line from the movie, if you believe, then the question is, what are you going to do about it? Are you ready to take up your cross and follow him? Are you ready to take the time to plan for your future, your future with God? 
and, and, and all it pops in my head. The excuses begin. Ah, I don't have time to get to church. I've got other things to get done. I just, I'm too busy. Or when you're asked to do something, well, I'm a little too young, or I'm a little too old. How old was Moses? He was, what, 80 when he's taking the Israelites to the desert? I don't have any money. Okay, you got some time? You got some talent? Those are the things. And then, and, you know, maybe, maybe it's, um, I don't like to be around people. That's all right. I got things you can do behind the scenes. God knows that we all have things going on in our lives, but he makes the time for us. We need to make the time for him. And, and somebody asked me to do something, and it's like, well, you don't know what I'm going through right now. Yeah, but God does. And I bet you, if you, you go out and you do this, you go out and you serve, you're going to see God work in your life. He's going to change your circumstance. Jesus never said it would be easy. I mean, you know, after they sinned, God told Adam and Eve what their consequences would be. Um, he told the woman, and you can go to Genesis 3 to read this. He says, I'm going to sharpen your pain in pregnancy. Your pain, so in short, pregnancy is going to hurt. Guys, we have no idea what that's like. And from what I understand, we're not the best at handling pain. So there's that. But he also told the woman that you would desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. And then he looks at the man and he said, and since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. And then he talks about how it's, you're going to have a struggle to make a living. And he talks about how the, the ground will be hard to, to cultivate and there'll be thorns and thistles that get in the way and, and that uh, prevent the grain from growing properly. And you're going to have to sweat it out. You're going to have to work hard. But in John 16, 31 and 33, Jesus asked, do you finally believe? He gets back to this, but the time is coming indeed. It's here now when you will be scattered each one going his own way, leaving me alone. Yes, yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have told you all this, so you may have peace in me. Have here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. I mean, I read this earlier, but I, I had to get back to it. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So we have that time with God. If we spend time with Jesus, Jesus has already overcome the world. And that means once our time here is come to an end, that we can go through that narrow gate and join him in heaven and spend our eternity with him. And that suffering, now think about this, eternity kind of blows your mind, right? It is just the concept of eternity. This is about how much your life is in eternity. I can't even quite get my fingers close enough. It'll be over pretty quickly. Time, and if you, most of you uh, may know like I have as I've gotten older, time goes faster. But all the pain and suffering that you're going to go through, it's going to be gone. And we just have to keep our eyes focused on him. We have to focus on the one who suffered for us, the one who offers us more than we can even comprehend. I love what Paul says uh, in, in Philippians, um, and, and the perspective that he brings to that is he's, as he told the Philippians about the priceless value of knowing Jesus. He says this, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus possessed, first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what the future or what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. He's focusing on what's coming. He, 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 go to uh, Hebrews 11, the faith chapter. Everybody, all these people in this chapter that are mentioned and those that aren't mentioned, the things that God is promising them, they don't see happen in their lifetimes, but they hold tight to that. They hold it dear because they know God's word is perfect. They know God will come through. So 
he reminds us in this passage that we need to look ahead at the heavenly prize that we receive from God through Jesus. So when we think back to Mark's message last week, when we think back to the Lenten season, we have to believe in what we are preparing for. Stop trying to squeeze God into your time. Make time for him. Then, then you can go out and serve God by living out your faith and let people see the hope that you have. Father God, let us make time for you, Father. Teach us to make time for you. Guide us back to your word, Father. And as we read your word, open up the scriptures to us. Help us to understand what you are telling us. Yes, Father, we know that this is a personal faith, like the personal decision. But Father, I would also challenge the people, Father, and I, I, I want you to challenge the people to come together as one. Just like what, the things that we were talking about on, on Wednesday night and, and then at our corporation meeting on Friday night. And the things that we have, Father, we want you to bring to fruition. That we want you to be in them. We want them to be because they bring honor and glory to you, Father. Whether it's a grief ministry or, or some financial ministry, whatever the ministry is, Father, we ask that you guide us and direct us that you show us how to be a church on the move, how we can rise up to show people the hope that we have because of our relationship with you. Father, let us make time for you so that people will see the fruit of our love for you. They will see the fruit of our belief and our, our hope in you, Father, through our love and through our actions. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor Terry. And as we proceed through our Lenten season, this time when we reflect, when we remember back and we take a look at our lives and we do our self-examinations and we are called to remember these things. We are called to remember God's word. We're called to remember the sacrifice that Christ made on our behalf. And I like to think of it as a parent. And we know that our children are gonna mess up, but it's gonna happen. Because when we were kids, hey, that's what we did. Guess who they learned from? Parents. So Jesus came to set the record straight, to take that sin, to take that disobedience upon himself to take that punishment that's standing in the corner from us. We're called to reflect on that and we're called to remember the sacrifice that he made for us to take on the sins that we, we commit. To take on that pain and that suffering and to release us from our death in sin from that bondage that we're tied to and to remember the sacrifice he made to release us and to bring us into that eternity with him. So on the night that he was given up, he took bread and he broke the bread and he said, take and eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Likewise, later in the meal, he took the cup and after he had filled it, he blessed the cup and he said, this is my body, a new covenant made between you and God for the forgiveness of sin. This is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Take and drink. And the word says that each time that we meet, we are to take the bread and drink from the cup in remembrance of that sacrifice that Christ made for us.
the body of Christ broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. Now if you're online or if you're here in present, we have these cups available to you. And they just reach out to us and tell us we'll make a way to get the cups to you. And uh, so that you can participate in communion with us as we go through and celebrate that remembrance of the sacrifice of Christ. We're also called to, as Pastor Terry said, is to reach out and to serve others. And one of the best ways that we can do that is in bringing forth by prayer and petition those needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ and even of those who do, are not believers and to bring them into that relationship, to give them that opportunity to know that there is a relationship available to them, that relationship with Christ. And so as we meet together on Wednesday nights, we, we have sheets that are multiple pages long and, and each week we add to those sheets as people bring us prayers and we ask you to please contact us uh, at Grace Street Church here so that we can pray for you, pray for your friends, pray for your relatives. Those who don't know and don't have that relationship with Christ, we want to be able to bring them into that relationship as well. And we have a lot of people that we want to just simply lift up in prayer, those who were written down, those who are on our hearts to lift up to Christ, those who might be suffering through pain or disease or loss, we lift them up right now in this prayer with Christ. Will you pray with me? Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we lift these people up, both silently and aloud, those who have been mentioned in our pages in writing, and those who sit still in our hearts, those who we have yet to pray for and those that are in need. And we ask that you would bring that need to our attention, Lord, those who we don't even know about. And we ask that you would help us to be that vehicle to bring that restoration of relationship back with you. Those who are lost, that, that one out of the 99 that is lost, Lord, we ask that you would help us bring them back into relationship with you. Help us to be the good shepherds, to be the brothers and sisters in Christ for those people today. And Lord, we just lift these people up to you today and we, we claim them and we name them in our hearts. We claim these things in your precious and holy name that they will be healed and that they will be convicted of where they are if they're in wrong and that they will be brought back into the fold, that they will come into that full knowledge and relationship with you, Lord God. We pray all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. So as we end our time together online, I'm drawn to Romans 8, a little bit further in the chapter, verses 38 and 39, and the last couple of verses in this, this particular chapter. Listen to what Paul writes to us. He says, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, help us to make time for you. Help us to, help us to just be changed by your Holy Spirit, the advocate that Jesus promised us. Father, let people see who we are by our love and our actions. And Father, we know that actions alone are not enough. 
that doesn't get us anywhere. But we also know that, that faith without actions is, is dead. So Father, let us be your hands and feet. Let us be the body of Christ. I, 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 Father, I hear the, the song running in my head as, as, the, as Mark uh, chose last week. And it starts off daily walking next to thee. Let that be, Father. Let us daily walk next to you because you're already walking next to us. Let it be a two-way street where we reach out to you, Father, where we know who you are. And thank you, Father, for your many blessings. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Now, for those of you that are watching online, keep an eye on the Facebook page. We'll put links up for the music that we're about to sing so that you can worship as well. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you all next week.